Ladies and gentlemen, one of Arizona Heart's longest tenured former employees. Since 1971, he puts the heart in Arizona Heart and the T in Texas. The Arizona Wrangler head cinematographer, past president of the Biological Photographers Association, the skipper of the Sailboat Triumph, the leader of Video Art Studio, the former marketing director of Arizona Heart, and one-time doubles front tennis champion, Richard Otto Dickalina, Big Dick Williams. That's right, you're not from Texas. That's right, you're not from Texas. That's Take right, it all off. Texas. Take it off. Texas, won't you anyway? That's right, you're not from Texas. Joy to the world, hook em horns. And I will point out that Texas did beat Michigan the last time they played them in the Rose Bowl. I'm just happy to have hair that needs to be cut. Oh, we need to go back one, because happy are those who dream dreams and are willing to pay the price to see those dreams come true. This was a motivational poster that was in the men's change room at St. Joe's Hospital <laughs> in 1973, in February, when I arrived. And I thought that was amazing. Is, and when they said they were going to have this evening, I, I thought of this immediately. Because this is quintessential Ted Dietrich. Happy are those who dream dreams and will pay the price to see them come true. It's the essence of the Heart Institute spirit. It's everything we're about. And I thought of that, and we should lead off with it because it personifies our beloved organization. Now, Paul Meyer, I thought, put in perspective very well the early days of the conditions that we met at St. Joe's. He talked about Ted's competitiveness, which we all know very well, particularly anyone that's been out on the fronton court. But and I've got a little pointer here, so I'll use it. If I can figure out how to make it work, I should. Can't have VAS without an audiovisual presentation. But the competitiveness, the team spirit, AHI was a team, the heart program, the OR functioned as a team, the ICU functioned as a team, the diagnostic group functioned as a team. And Ted was the leader, the coach, and everything that we did, everything that he did, led to the group functioning as a team. All of this section of St. Joe's Hospital, if you walked in in 1973, the staff was dressed in green scrubs. But this little floor over here, the second floor of the barrel wing, was the Heart Institute wing. And in that wing, everyone was dressed in blue scrubs. So you knew immediately that when you saw a blue scrub, you saw one of the team members on the heart team. And that was my introduction to the staff. We, of course, functioned as a group. And in the very early days, we had a team photo. And this is I'm, some in the audience will see themselves. And I have a few other team photos uh, to show. But anyway, this is the first one that we took in 1973. And of course, we took it both ways. Ron Brandon is here tonight, uh, was one of our first illustrators. And he and I personally uh, put the paper out. Ron went to the butcher shop and got white butcher paper so that we could have the AHI. And that was our first group photo. The interesting point afterwards was that after everyone left and went back up to work, uh, we had to clean up. Ron and I rolled up the paper and we didn't have any place to put it, so we rolled it under John Green's office. It rained that night, and so here we had all this blue and white paper 
under Dr. Green's office and the security people contact us the next day and say, you guys got to get out there and get rid of this paper. Dr. Green's going nuts. So anyway, the point that I wanted to make was that in, particularly in VAS or medical communication in those days at St. Joe's, the rule was that we had no excuses for performance. This is a picture of the finest cinematographer I've ever known. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Hook 'em horns. Happy are those who dream dreams. And I can tell you, I'll tell you uh, one antidote, but you know, I've got many. But no, the point is that this is a boom that was built, a custom built boom that was designed and fabricated in Houston, Texas. There are only three in the world. This one belongs in the Smithsonian, as far as I'm concerned because it enabled us to achieve quality results that we couldn't do any other way. And trust me, I understood, because I spent five years in Galveston, the University of Texas Medical Branch, and the goal, they didn't have the dreams or the willingness to pay the price. Their philosophical direction was find the pecking order, get in it, and don't get out. Here we're given the best tools to work with. This is a Aeroflex with a 1,200 foot magazine that would give us 36 minutes of 16 millimeter film that we could film continuously. The normal way to do it would be to have 400 feet uh, magazines. Anyway, these technicalities, uh, this glass ingenue 12 to 240 zoom lens, this is the only medical facility in the world. There are only 22 of them built in the world. And they were built for Hollywood and, and uh, cinema production and we had the only one that you would ever find in a medical facility. So the point is that, that Ted Dietrich and the organization provided us with the tools to produce. And the charge was to achieve excellence, to do your best. And if you had any complaints, all you had to do was look in the mirror to find the problem. Because you were given the tools to work with, you were given the projects and you were given the support. So with those kind of opportunities, you had no one to blame but yourself if you couldn't achieve it. This is interesting. I think Ted Dietrich has mentioned a number of times the first person that he hired at the Arizona Heart Institute. This is a wonderful photograph because it encapsulates three important elements. This gentleman in the front is Jerry Hodge, and he was the medical artist in Michigan and we know where Ted started his career, his academic career. The person behind him is Bill Wynn, and Bill Wynn was the first employee of the Arizona Heart Institute. He was at Dallas at the medical school uh, in a program uh, teaching, and he was the first person hired before the Heart Institute, before Ted left Houston to even come out. The person over the shoulder is Steve Harrison, who was the second director of medical communications. Bill was a graduate of the Georgia program. Steve was a graduate of the Georgia program. But Jerry Hodge played a very important role in affecting Ted's great interest and love for biocommunication, medical communication, audiovisual. And this is a wonderful photograph because it happens to encapsulate three, capture all three of them, who became very important in the development of our program. Bill Wynn's contribution was the first heart logo, which we affectionately referred to as the chicken heart, because it just, you know, not that strong, <laughs> even though it's anatomically correct, that's fine. It, for a logo and a mark, it was a good first, uh, but wasn't going to make it all the way. Steve Harrison, after Bill left and went back to the Dallas program, uh, Steve Harrison uh, took over as the illustrator uh, in charge of the program. And he brought Ron Brandon in. Uh, Steve's contribution also, in addition to a lot of medical art that has been used in films and lectures, it was Steve Harrison who produced the original, or the heart logo that we have today and has become so iconic 
in our history. Now, Ron, who joined us tonight, by the way, came all the way in from Boston, uh, is credited with uh, being the medical illustrator who coined the tetraphic uh, term. And this is the uh, birthday celebration that occurred in uh, St. Joe's Hospital where the life photographers were doing uh, their research and uh, writing and photography. And the birthday celebration was uh, celebrated on, up in surgery and uh, lab coats were silk screened down in medical communication. And uh, we're very grateful to Joyce Dunshee for preserving a set along with the magazine. And she's donated it. We have a display in VAS uh, with this uh, historic piece. But it was Ron that came up with the idea and uh, the execution of that, which became somewhat well known. The role that Ron really played for us, though, uh, the illustrators that we looked at, uh, were trained classically uh, to produce art for publication. And it was Ron that brought us the first uh, multi-imaging, uh, multifaceted pr production uh, where we use slides and film together uh, in order to uh, communicate, uh, and particularly in medical communication. So Ron decided to uh, seek opportunity in Boston. Steve Harrison came back and he established the first medical illustration program. And our first medical illustration uh, intern was Keith Kasnot, who becomes important to us later. Um, at this particular point in time, we build an institute on 20th Street. And this is the home of the first fronton. Now, this really becomes very important to us because as we all know, Ted is so committed to exercise and fitness and competition that all of the employees are encouraged to participate and uh, do so many. Uh, if you don't want to play the game, then you're certainly going to be involved in the celebration of the front tennis, uh, front tennis tournaments that we've heard about. And um, so everyone gets involved. You notice, of course, that we have uniforms and shirts available for all the activities, and uh, so no one's left out. Uh, the wonderful thing about the tournaments is that he would bring the world champion uh, competitors up from Mexico, and he would team them up with uh, uh, the players uh, at the Institute to give us all an opportunity to play with quality players. That made it a lot more fun. Uh, the one thing that always bothered me, though, and I love the game along with a number of other colleagues at the Institute, uh, but I would play singles with, with Dr. Dietrich. And I think I've played over about 30 years. And I have not once won a singles match with Ted Dietrich, even after he had a hip replacement. <laughs> I would go, and I was in pretty good shape, and I played the game re reasonably well. But every time I got close, close to beating him, he would come up with these stomps, or all of a sudden, as I get ready to hit the ball, he would say, look out now, you got to hit it. And of course, distract me. And anyway, the, the point is, I didn't win one singles match with him. The only way we finally won was for me to team up with Barbie Calabrese and played mixed doubles, and we did win uh, the championship for the mixed doubles. He was, though, an equal opportunity. He did give everybody a chance, and I noticed he was in his Dorothy outfit, and this is my Dickalina outfit. Maybe if he had come out and played in the Dorothy outfit, I might have had a chance to win it. Well, anyway, everyone is well aware uh, Ted's interest in sailing, and I was lucky enough uh, to be able to uh, provide the cinematography and still photography services that was needed in order to document uh, the sailing experiences and do very important research. Uh, it was probably not 
totally necessary, but I certainly enjoyed it, uh, contrary to my wife and children's thought about what I should be doing. I put this photograph in because it shows triumph in front in this particular race. You see his boat way off in the distance. It's not in front because it's way out of the course. Uh, but this shows that Ted's going to be competitive. And yes, we're going to have uniforms <laughs> because the team needs to be trained. And this is Ron here. And, but he took a completely fresh team, a uh, fresh group of people that had never sailed together within a year's time, whipped them into shape. And of course, they had to look like a team. Then they had to have dress shirts and whatnot. Uh, our lift off to Hawaii for three days looked something like this. Uh, two thirds of the crew was seasick and it gave me a wonderful opportunity to be able to sail. I've never gotten seasick, so I had a chance to actually, by necessity, uh, provide sailing services. But everything was great. After 15 days out in the open sea, we finally hit Hawaii. This is coming through the Molokai Channel. Everyone gets dressed in their dress uniform, shirts and regalia and sail into Hawaii uh, feeling a great sense of accomplishment. Well, back to the Heart Institute, about this time we're into ABC 2020, the era of Paula Banahan, who's here with us tonight, and uh, the Great American Heart Test. 250,000 response. Now, we know that Ted's always had an appreciation for media and marketing, uh, but there is no question that this ABC event uh, was something that was unexpected. And out they come with 250,000 responses for the nationwide uh, response to the test. And uh, it required quite, a, quite an effort for the whole team to be able to grade the test and send uh, responses back. Ted may want to mention it later. Uh, but it was a major uh, event in the Heart Institute's experience. Well, we also know that uh, He's interested and involved in uh, athletics, and, he, and a few other of his friends got involved in the USFL. Um, he and uh, his good friend, Coach George Allen, uh, put the effort in, <laughs> brought Tad and Jim Banahan involved, uh, to put together the USFL football team. Again, the group is open to the employees and staff of the Heart Institute, uh, particularly after he moved the team from Chicago down to Arizona. Uh, we were all involved in all aspects. Uh, VAS has an opportunity to uh, do the coaching films and the highlight films and the PSAs and uh, we were delighted to be able to participate. Um, we also established our first internship, and uh, young Bob Woolley, uh, we, his brother happened to be on our Pop Warner football team, and so it became a very natural fit. And uh, Chris is here in his younger days, and he joins VAS as an intern. We pay him a whopping $100 uh, for the month, and he 24-7. It is the experience of his life, but he now is our managing partner at VAS. What a parlor. Now, a word from one of your friends. Good evening, everyone, and especially you, Dr. Dietrich. 30 years ago, we came together to form the Chicago Blitz, and what an experience that was. Forget that three of your people on that staff became NFL general managers, and one became a general manager in Canada and won the Grey Cup championship. It was that bonding and togetherness that players today and coaches today that came from the USFL still say was the best experience in their life. Whether it was you getting that secret airplane so we could fly down to Athens, Georgia, and at the time illegally signed Herschel Walker, even though we didn't get to play with them. Or you helping to coordinate the signing of Jim Kelly. Or of course, all those great ticket events where Jim Banahan sold at least two or three tickets, even though we had 5,000 people in the crowd. It was a great experience. You've always been an innovator. It was great to have you in the sports world, and we miss you. We hope you have a great evening tonight.
So right in the middle of all this, uh, Ted thought he'd throw a little ringer in, and we'd just do the first heart, tra or heart operation live on PBS. And literally, we'd been out on the field during the day uh, practicing what they call two-a-days. And we come in that evening, and we broadcast through PBS uh, the first heart operation live. Uh, I think Paul mentioned earlier it was to the nation, but it really was to the world. And it was carried in England as well as uh, the United States. Uh, but anyway, Time Magazine covers it, and uh, the local and national press uh, pick it up and it becomes somewhat of a sensation. Uh, the TV Guide uh, referenced it and their best and worst at the end of the year. And uh, we fortunately came out with uh, a good, good rating from uh, our friends at the TV Guide. Now our uh, next group photo, which is over on 20, which was at 22nd Street. And I think there's probably a few people in the audience that should recognize themselves. So take a good look at it, because the group photo is going to come into play here in just a moment. Uh, at this point in time, Keith Kasnot joins our team as the medical illustrator and uh, creative director. Keith brings to us uh, a continuation, or he picks up where Ron Brandon left off with the multi-imaging, multimedia technology. And Keith teams with Ted in designing and developing this major, major presentation uh, in multi-imaging, multi-slide uh, format. And it's a very large 60-foot screen uh, and a major presentation that we take to the, initially uh, to the Sun Dome, 5,000 people in the audience, and uh, all on the, uh, history of, via, of uh, cardiovascular disease and, and how to treat it and uh, take an active interest in it. Keith is uh, the designer, the genius behind it, uh, Mark Birchfield, and our program director, our managing uh, business manager become uh, quite skilled. Very successful, which goes on, and, and we show it on the road and take it around uh, to a number of locations for presentation. This time also, uh, the Channel 3 uh, relationship begins and goes on for 20 years plus with Ask Dr. Dietrich, uh, a major portion of our program, and also uh, Keith and, and Lee Barkley produce uh, This Man Knows a Thing or Two About Hearts, which is, launches our uh, activity in, in marketing and advertising. The Institute on uh, 20th is built, and Mark Shornack joins our team. And the, the thing about our medical artists is that Ted's enjoyed over the years, the greatest artists in the business have worked with us, and he's enjoyed uh, their counsel and, and the product of their efforts, and we've been very fortunate to have it. Uh, this is a closet that we start, and Karen DeWitt certainly will remember this, uh, our little cubby hole that we start at with uh, the Humana Hospital. Uh, but it leads to bigger and better things, and we end up uh, broadcasting worldwide out of that little closet and uh, move over to the Heart Hospital with the MedCath uh, program and uh, into uh, 21st century class world-class quality uh, robotics and uh, video capabilities, which we've been using just this week uh, with the Congress. And we expand our distribution capabilities with worldwide distribution. And our group photo, one of our group photos at the Institute, uh, and a few more people in the audience should recognize themselves in this. Along about this time, our boy wonder, uh, Chris Woolley, begins to uh, grow and dream uh, his own interest in producing uh, medical documentaries uh, for uh, public broadcast. And uh, one of Ted's friends, Cliff Robertson, uh, graciously donates his time and efforts, and Chris produces uh, medical innovations. Uh, you saw a clip earlier on Play Animation. I think it has uh, long 
long-ranging effects, and long after I'm gone, this quality of work will still have shelf life and, and still be valid, and I think will still be uh, used, and certainly should be. We continue to work in support of the Congress and lurking ever behind in the background is the little Dickman genius three, as we refer. And Wayne uh, produces uh, his uh, version of a documentary with the silence and all of the recent openings to Congress and uh, now we have Mike Austin as our medical illustrator. And we have our last group photo of the team. The team that's in, ready to serve and the people who touched the heart. Now, some of you are probably ready for a potty break, but we probably should do an Ein Prosit. So, Chief, get your microphone going. How can you have I'm pros with no, with no drinks? Yeah. Well, you, I've got a drink. I, who doesn't have a drink? Raise your hand. If he needs a drink, then somebody, please. You probably need a potty break. We have to, okay, let's go take a potty break. So we do have and, and let's have some drinks. Get the drinks, man. Uh, come on, get up and do it. Everybody, please return in 10 minutes. We'll be on what Rodriguez will present, and then we will play it home. Oh, fuck you. Yeah. 